right, well, hello and welcome to the very first episode of the unofficial Gilded Age After Show. We are really excited to be here and happy that you are joining us to talk all things HBO's new series, The Gilded Age. Um, We are very excited to be here. I'll start by introducing myself. My name is Kelsey Paul. I am the Manager of Interpretation and Engagement at the Frick Pittsburgh. I am joined by two of my favorite colleagues uh, in our learning and curatorial departments. We have Melanie Groves, who is our Manager of Exhibitions and Registrar. And then we also have Amanda Gillen, who is the Director of Learning and Visitor Experience. And we are history nerds. We are Gilded Age nerds. Uh, We do this for a living. We talk the Gilded Age all of the time. And so we are excited to actually get to do this while watching a television show. Like many people, we were excited to see Julian Fellow's new show about the Gilded Age debut finally on HBO. And we thought, what a great opportunity to talk a little history, talk a little pop culture, talk costumes, talk acting, all of those things. Um, We're going to start by sort of explaining why we're we're doing this and who we are and where we fit into this. Um, for those of you who maybe aren't familiar with the Frick Pittsburgh and who we are, um, we are a Gilded Age uh, historic site uh, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and we have three museums on site, one of which is the historic home of Henry Clay Frick and his family who lived there during the Gilded Age. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about who the Fricks were and sort of where they fit into the context of the Gilded Age. Um, Amanda, do you want to talk a little bit about who the Fricks are, where they fit in, and maybe also what they were doing in 1882 um, when our show on the Gilded Age debuts. Yeah, happy to. Hi, everyone. So excited to be chatting with you today. Um, So Henry Clay Frick was um, a very prominent industrialist in Pittsburgh and really in the United States. He made his money in the um, coke and coal business. Coke is a byproduct of coal necessary for making steel. If you know anything about the past of Pittsburgh, you know that we are a steel city. And so um, Mr. Frick connects with Andrew Carnegie, becomes the sole supplier to Andrew Carnegie, the industrialist um, mills in Pittsburgh. Together, those two men um, really shape our city, but also a lot of the industry in the late 19th century uh, in the United States. So Frick is um, a multimillionaire who grew up just outside of Pittsburgh, raised his family in Pittsburgh at, at Clayton, which is the home that is part of our museum, the Frick Pittsburgh, and then eventually moves to New York. Um, he marries Adelaide Childs, who is a Pittsburgh Society woman. They have four children, two of whom they raised to adulthood. So they are very much kind of a microcosm of that Pittsburgh new money life, if you will, which we will be talking um, more about. Yeah, and we we have some photos that we can show to you of both Clayton and um, Mr. and Mrs. Frick. This is a perfect photo sort of to start with of Mr. and Mrs. Frick and because this is taken right around that 1881-1882 window. Um, So if you've watched the first episode of The Gilded Age, you know that we sort of open in 1882. And so it's actually an interesting connection for us at the Frick because that's really when Mr. and Mrs. Frick were sort of at the beginning of their sort of journey into the society that is sort of represented on the Gilded Age. They're newlyweds um, and they buy their home Clayton in Pittsburgh shortly after that. So it's really sort of a fortuitous connection um, for us. Um, But like you said, you know, the characters in Gilded Age are sort of in a different part of their journey than where the Fricks were in 1882. The Fricks get there, but they're not there in 1882. Um, They don't move to uh, New York City until 1905, but um, they are definitely sort of that new, that new money that we do see in the show. Um, so we're going to start with a fan question, actually. Um, we thank you to our Instagram followers who um, submitted some questions that they had after watching the first episode of the show. And we wanted to start with um, one question from our Instagram follower, J. Lib Scott. Um, their question was, which characters are fictional in the show and which ones are real, which is a great question and something that we were talking a lot about and, and paying attention. So who are the fictional characters? I think most most of our main characters are fictional, um, with some new, with some real people mixed in. Who are who are our real people that are mixed in? There's like two or three that are, I think are noteworthy. Yeah, I think um, so. We definitely are hearing about the Astors. I'm pretty sure we've heard the Vanderbilts sort of dropped in there. Um, I think Carolyn Astor is really one of the important real people that we're going to hear a lot about. Is she? sort of controlled Gilded Age society in New York. Um, 
And then we definitely heard Stanford White too, who has some Pittsburgh connections and is a major architect in the Gilded Age. So we've got some photos here. Um, here we have Carolyn Astor on the left is the real Carolyn Astor, who um, I heard a little interview with Julian Fellows saying, you know, he didn't see that she was a particular kind of beauty and he never read anything funny that she had to say. So um, there was something definitely like mesmerizing about her. She controlled a room and somehow she controlled all of New York society without either of those two things, certainly um, a lot of wealth. And then we see her played in the, in the episode and in the series by Donna Murphy here. Um, and I think it's so interesting. She sort of looms large in this first episode, but we don't actually see her until the very end, which I think is such a, like a <laughs> device that they use. Like she's sort of like this specter that hangs over the, the episode and she's referred to by name, but we don't see her until the end. Um, and she's sort of very much put up as like the gatekeeper to this New York society that Russell's, who we'll talk about in a second, really want. We hear her name and I mm -hmm. didn't catch on to this right away, but her daughter is introduced in the series first, also right. Carolyn, but Carrie after. So right. um, she's definitely hanging over our heads for the whole Yeah, thing. they were, I had, you know, I've done a little bit of reading about her since then and everywhere she's sort of referred to as the Mrs. Astor or Mrs. <laughs> Astor. So yeah, because she and her daughter are both Caroline, but when you're referring to the senior Caroline, you're referring to the Mrs. Astor or Mrs. Astor. Um, and they talk about her in that, in that way a lot in the show. This actress looks so much like her. I hadn't looked at it compared like this. Um, it's good casting. I yeah, mean, I was yeah. impressed. Yeah. It's good casting for sure. It's interesting um, how these names, like they did, the show does assume a certain amount of Gilded Age New York knowledge. I mean, the Astor name is, is common and well-known, but there are others that I know we'll talk about that you have to, you have to know something about this time period, maybe to be picking up on those subtle references. Yeah, absolutely. And we, and so we, we have, we also have Mamie Fish who, speaking of, that's one that I was not familiar with. I wasn't familiar with her name. Um, so I didn't immediately pick up on the fact that she's a character in the show, but she's also a real person. Um, but she was, we have her here on the left, uh, the real, the real deal. And then she's over on the, on the right, sort of pictured in the center, the actress that plays her. Um, and we get a, we get a, we get Mamie in Newport, which is an interesting, um, reference that's sort of like thrown in there, but it, we've kind of felt like it was a little bit of a throwaway. They, they, they sort of like reference Newport and say, we're going to Newport, but they don't really talk about what Newport is. So what is the significance of Newport in Gilded Age society, particularly in New York? I'm gonna let Amanda take that one. <laughs> and now you want this one? <laughs> um, so Newport is the Mecca of Gilded Age homes. Um, watch me get some of these names wrong, but you know, the Breakers, it was the, the coastal homes on the coast of Rhode Island that was, it was just this, um, unimaginable wealth sort of concentrated in one area that resulted in homes, each one bigger and more showy than the next um, beautiful places. A lot of them still exist. Um, there is a Newport Preservation Society. I'm sure some of our viewers have been. I have never been, um, but oh, we I haven't either, but I want to go really bad. <laughs> yeah, <field trip. laughs> um, but homes that were just, I mean, beyond anything you can imagine, if you think about the Gilded Age and this idea of, you know, disparity of wealth and opulence, you know, at extreme, the extreme end, that is, that is Newport. It was a place where really wealthy families would summer. It had its own sort of cultural milieu around it. Um, and we actually will be hopefully having a special guest with us um, coming up in the next couple of weeks um, to talk more about what Newport is what's what it was what it is today um but yeah so you know this scene shows them enjoying the outdoor atmosphere that was Newport the croquet being on the lawns being by the water it was this sort of like summer um pleasure area for the incredibly wealthy people of the Gilded Age and they refer to them as cottages but they are not <laughs> cottages by any stretch of like the normal expectation of what the word cottage <laughs> means um, they are huge. I did want to, as like a plug to the New York mansions, I was spent some time on their website today. They have amazing virtual tours of their, uh, of the different cottages. So if you're curious and you sort of want to know realistically what these houses were like, it's unbelievable and incredible. Um, but yeah, so we get to see sort of a, a glimpse into that through 
through Marion Mamie Fish, but she was quite the character. I've done some reading about her and she seems like a lot of fun. And we get a lot, a little bit of that in the, in the um, episode, they kind of allude to that because she's making everybody play games. Like she's, she's that hostess that has activities that you're kind of like, I don't want to do that, but I guess I will, (laughs) you know? (laughs) She's kind of stuck in a role of matchmaker too. She's kind of pairing people up into little groups. And I love, she tells them, you know, anybody, any idiot can play croquet, any fool can play croquet. And we know that's not true because (laughs) we've had little croquet events and it is, all of the society pieces to it are difficult and the scoring and kind of who walks around and takes care of the rules and, and rules. And the we matches. weren't doing it while we were wearing bustles either. So there's that aspect of it too. Or carrying a parasol. What do you do with your parasol while you're picking up your mallet? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, she's, she's, I thought she was interesting in this show and I don't know how much of this is really plays into who she was as an actual person, but she is sort of, seems to be the um the person who's sort of shepherding in that younger generation of society because she is she's doing that sort of matchmaking she's doing a lot of introductions it seems to be you know we see the russell's son and the astor's daughter who are there with sort of this like second generation or however it's not the second it's many generations but that younger generation of new york society that have gone out to newport um so i'm interested to see kind of what role she plays sort of going forward yeah she's Um, an important device in the sense of like you need someone like that that's going to be part of the storyline we can tell these younger people getting together maybe younger people who shouldn't be getting together you know kind of liking each other and so she was playing that role and then also just the humor right she was there as like a a wit factor I think that was was um, a needed infusion in some of those scenes yeah and so then the last the kind of character that Melanie mentioned is this character of Stanford White who was another very real human being um in the gilded age we have him here we were remarking on his incredible mustache in real life that the actor who plays him doesn't have quite um as full of a mustache um in the show as what's depicted in his actual photograph but um he was a real architect um and a very influential architect he was a member um of an uh, architectural firm called McKim Mead and White um and I they sort of allude in the show that in 1882 he's sort of at the beginning of his influence and career um but over sort of the course of the Gilded Age definitely into the 1890s um he and that architectural firm I mean they're responsible for sort of rebuilding New York and sort of turning it into kind of what you see today I feel like most of the gilded age things buildings civic centers you know all of those things that you even see today were probably built by Stanford White or his architectural firm <laughs> the original um, Madison Square Garden yeah. is one of his major accomplishments for sure mm-hmm. yeah and so it's sort of his name is sort of dropped early that he is the architect of the Russell's lavish mansion which we'll talk about in a little bit um and but a risky then, choice too like yes. where this picks up is he's kind of a young up upstart so um it'll be interesting to follow his ascension through the show if he's included too yeah because when we do finally see him he you know he does come to the russell's party um he's one of the few that sort of actually do show up and um he sort of alludes to the fact that he probably doesn't have as much influence in society as maybe the Russells are hoping that he does. I think they're thinking that maybe by him coming, some other people will show up and he's kind of like, I don't know if I have quite that amount of influence, but he definitely will in real life. I mean, he became a very recognizable person of very high standards um, in society in New York City after he starts to build all of these all of these um, buildings and things. So I think we'll see him um, more in the show for sure. Um, But let's talk about the fictional characters, because those are obviously mostly our main characters. And I was just listening to an interview with Julian Fellows talking about how he sort of figures out who he wants to be in the show and why he sort of chooses to sprinkle in real people, but mostly he focuses on fictional. And he was saying that there's less pressure (laughs) to get things right, which I totally, I mean, that makes sense. Um, And so instead of sort of choosing a real person to be the main focus of his shows, he intend, he instead likes to create a fictionalized character who's sort of an amalgam of a lot of real people, which is what I think we're seeing with the Van Ryan family, the Brooke family, and the Russells. They're, they're amalgams of real society people in New York, even if they themselves are not real people. I think I listened to that same interview and I loved, he kind of said, 
a real person can go through a five-year period of just being completely dull and boring and you have nothing to write about. Yeah. Um, but I also really appreciated learning a little bit about um, Mr. Russell and he referred to him uh, as being sort of based off of Jay Gold um, and, and referenced his ruthless business side, but also that he was a loving father and really a caring husband and like the marriage was really good. And I thought that was interesting because I think we all, because we're so close to Mr. Frick, kind of noticed that Russell is, you know, a little frickish and, and that part <laughs> um, really struck me because we do talk about how he is a ruthless businessman, but the family life was so totally different. And so I think maybe that's something that we're picking up on that the show's getting right is kind of nailing those relationships and those two separate worlds for being a successful businessman in the Gilded Age. Yeah, absolutely. I, yeah, I thought that was so interesting. And it did. It totally stuck out to me because we talk about that all the time within the context of Mr. Frick, that Mr. Frick and the men like him had reputations for being ruthless. It's it's funny. I, I he's it's like Mr. Russell is definitely they kind of picked up on Jay Gould, but I think he really could be based off of any of those men. I mean, any of those industrialist men like him, because they were sort of all cut from the same cloth. They They had a playbook that they were sort of operating off of Mr. Frick in particular though is someone who has sort of a ruthless reputation but yeah he has that softer side that he wasn't showing in business but mm -hmm. because we work with his home and with his you know the memory of his family and things we we see a little bit more of that that side so I thought that was interesting too. Easy in the Gilded Age I think or there's a tendency to distill things to like the polar ends right you know right. like like the almost like a caricature of of what we of a person in that time period. And I think there is some of the, that in this show, like some of the storylines or, or, or the people or the roles they're playing are kind of expected in a way. Um, I'm hoping they, they evolve some of those, those characters, um, like this old money, new money thing, which I know we're going to talk about, but that idea of a man who is, you know, yeah, aggressive and ruthless. Yeah. Those, those guys were absolutely out there, you know, um, shaping the world and, and Frick was one of them and Russell's one of them. Um, but I, I, I agree with you. I hope they continue to evolve that character into someone who is multidimensional because nobody's all one thing, you know, and, and right. it'll be a better show if they can kind of keep up with that private side too. Yeah, for sure. So we can talk about obviously the other, the people across the street. <laughs> We've talked about the Russells who are this new money. They're, they're making their money in railroads, which is, you know, they're, they're growing fast and they're getting rich quickly, which is different from across the street, which represents the old money families who that that's generational wealth. There are people who have been in New York City for a very long time tracing, you know, there's lots of mentions to like, we can trace our family back to the Mayflower or the revolution. And so that's sort of what they're sort of working in. Um, and that's the Van Rines and the Brooke family, um, which are, again, they're fictional families, but they are very much based in reality. And I think this is a good way for us to sort of segue into another thing we want to talk about, which is the ladies that are sort of front and center in this episode. Um, and we remarked on the fact that what struck all of us was that each of the kind of fe female characters that we have in the show that are sort of the main characters sort of represent a different aspect of womanhood in this period. Um, there's a there's a concept that if you are have read anything about the Gilded Age or, or read about women in the Gilded Age, you'll you'll hear a lot, which is this idea of the true woman, which is these really remarkably stringent standards for what a woman should aspire to be in the Gilded Age. And I think there are lots of different representations of that and what that might have looked like in the show. Um, you have, obviously, we can start with Ada and Agnes. I think they're two sort of particularly good examples. Um, let's start with Agnes, because she's, I mean, she looms large also. <laughs> Christine Baranski looms large, obviously. Um, she's amazing in it, but she's, she's a widow, which is an interesting sort of place for a woman to be in the Gilded Age, but she's a wealthy widow, which is, you know, you, Melanie, you talked about this idea that all of the women in the show are sort of at the mercy, or we see in different ways how they are at the mercy of the men in their lives um, in some way or another. Um, and I think Agnes is one example of that, the fact that she's married into this very wealthy old money family 
but they talk briefly about the fact that that maybe wouldn't have been the marriage that she would have chosen if she for sh- yeah for sure they talk about it comes at a cost for right. sure like that marriage and that wealth came at a cost and um it totally connects to their brother and sort of how he squandered their family wealth so they were in a position both Agnes and Ada of figuring out what they were going to do um and how they can create some kind of agency for themselves. And it just struck me, uh, their situation. And then when we get into looking at Marion's situation, just how precariously women are dangling throughout the Gilded Age and how quickly that thread, whatever that is, um, that line of money can be sort of cut for a woman and, and what you have to do to make up for it. And yeah, they definitely talk about how um, Agnes, was in a marriage that was not an easy situation for her. And I think we're going to hear more about what that meant and the life that she was able to cut in the past. She cut for Ada um, and then how they're going to help Marion get through it too. Yeah. She may, Agnes makes a sort of early on a sort of comment one-liner to Ada about, you know, the fact that Ada was lucky to be unattached and to not have ever been married and I don't know that Ada looks at it that way necessarily I don't know that she considers herself lucky um there's a lot of I think like taboo-ness to being a quote-unquote spinster in this period they call her a spinster pretty early on I feel like which is so sad it's such like a weighted word (laughs) for sure like old maid yeah yeah we've Um, been conditioned to think of that as definitely like a position you don't want to be in right Agnes is so I was a little bit surprised at how vocal she is about how bad her marriage was and I guess that's Mm. to get the point across to to us as the viewer like we need to know that but there were a couple of scenes where she was it's interesting because she clearly married that man and suffered in in silence or whatever it was she did to get through and he's now gone but she was like bold like it was bad you know Mm. she was I was surprised at how she was you know her 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 comment her commentary on her own marriage was strong (laughs) clearly a lot of deep-seated feelings about what she's been through but it doesn't change the pride that she clearly has in the van ryan name and in the status that comes along with it i think she she almost makes it clear that it's like yes i had to marry this man it was what i had to do it's not necessarily what i wanted to do but i'm still proud of the decision i made and it means something because i'm still honored to sort of be a part of this lineage and she talks about the fact how the Brooke family is also connected through the Livingstons which was a real mm-hmm. revolutionary era lulled old family in New York City um so there's a lot of pride in that in the same way and I think she talks to you know I think she wants Marion to understand that maybe because there's there's they're sort of set up as foils to each other like Marion obviously very much doesn't relate to Agnes and feels like she's too strict and she's too old fashioned and whatever. But I think they did sort of end up in similar situations because Marion was also misled by her father. She believed that their family was financially sound. And then once he passes away, that's not the case. And so that precariousness, Melanie, that you were talking about, that's where, where Marion sort of finds herself without parents, without, she's single, she's unmarried, and she doesn't have a lot of financial options. She's lucky enough to have these very wealthy aunts who are willing to take her in but not all not all women that would find themselves in that situation would be lucky enough um to do that um let's clear yeah go ahead quickly about you know you're at the mercy of these men and also I was saying this to you guys in another scenario but what you're told about your life right so Marion grows up thinking that the house is owned by her family and that right. she has resources and so you you know for for women like you only knew what you were what was shared with you or what you know, you were told to believe about your life. And then that changes in a second. And that's, that really struck me. It's like you go through operating thinking you've got your life under control, but you're so reliant on other people, the men in your life. And that man, her dad failed all three of those women, right? The two sisters and her and left them all in this scenario that none of them bargained for. So that was just so, um, I don't know, it just really struck me. It's like, whatever they told you is what you, all you knew, you know, that was really something until it changed. Yeah, until it's not the case anymore. I want to talk about the other thing that all of these women know in these high society, which is sort of, we get a sense of the very complicated 
navigation that they have to all sort of be aware of within this high society of New York. You have sort of Agnes and Ada who seem to know the rules. They're part of the old order. They have it all sort of figured out. You have Marion who's being dropped into this, who is so naive and doesn't seem to understand sort of all of the ins and outs of what she's about to walk into. Um, and then you have Mrs. Russell, Bertha, who is trying to get into this society and she's very hell bent on getting in with the right people and doing it the right way. But it's very clear that she doesn't really know what the right way is. And one of the things that we were talking about is that we see this practice of calling and socializing um, and there's a lot of etiquette. And I feel like it's such a foreign concept to modern understanding of socializing. So we wanted to sort of talk a little bit about what that is. And we have some examples that we can show because we know, you know, Mrs. Frick, called. She had calling days. We understand how that worked within the context of, of Pittsburgh and what Mrs. Frick was doing. So can someone just please explain to me how this calling thing was supposed to work and what the point of all of this was? <laughs> Melanie, you got this one? <laughs> oh, sure. Um, so we have some images here. Um, one is one shows some of Mrs. Frick's calling cards. Um, so they've got her name and it says Mondays down in the corner. So um, you could give these out to women in society um, and they would know that you were holding calling hours at your home um, on Mondays. Sometimes there might be hours. Um, Mrs. Fricks is not indicating hours on here, um, but you would be prepared. You would be sitting and ready to either come down to your reception room or um, to greet guests, you would be dressed and prepared. You'd know who was coming. Um, and then we also have an image here showing that these visits were logged and, you know, you were expected as a woman in society to go visit the right people. And um, Mrs. Frick is, is logging who's coming to visit her, taking their addresses, you know, I would say seemingly so that she can then reciprocate and she can call on them. So they would have a different calling day and a different calling card. And so you had a responsibility in a way as a woman in society to be going out and visiting people and sort of give, giving you an opportunity or gave them an opportunity to show off some of their fashion, to show off um, maybe a carriage or you know how they're getting there and then to show off your home, what's going on there. Um, and then keeping up those relationships too, just kind of talking about you know, I think, I think the calls would be short, uh, you know, um, Amanda, you probably maybe know better, but 15, 20 minutes, I think um, we have that traveling coat. So, you know, you're even stopping in with your coat still on, you're not taking off your coat. It's not sitting down to tea. It's, it's a business transaction for sure for these women. Um, and it definitely struck me that Bertha seems like she's not doing it right. So <laughs> I don't know what she's doing with this big um, open house party. I don't, I'm not certain that that was not typical. It definitely seems like it's not how old money works. And it seems like she's trying to allure people with this idea that you can get, you're curious about what's going on in that big house. And we saw um, the old money talking about, you know, that, that new mansion down yeah, the like, corner. Wink, wink, like. <laughs> That uh, magnificent, ugh, magnificent <laughs> mansion on the corner, we've all seen it go up. And so she invites them all to the house, but certainly not in maybe the way that old money expects. And, and old money doesn't, old New York doesn't want to be seen there anyway. She's missing the cues, the, the wink winks that we were laughing about, or does she not care? Does she think that this home is what's going to win you all over? Is she not? Is Bertha sort of oblivious to their side glances? I don't think she is because there's that scene where they go to the charity function, which is another sort of hallmark of what is an expectation for a, a woman of this class in this period to be doing. That's the that's the way that you get out of the house and kind of do something, right? Like you're not like most of these women in the traditional sense are not going out and getting a job, but they're doing charity work. That's what that's the way that they sort of contribute to society. Um, now you see characters like Marion and Peggy who sort of represent that next generation of women who are thinking about getting into the workforce, which we'll talk a little bit when we talk about Peggy. Um, but I think Bertha does pick up on it because she picks up on sort of the subtle maybe not so subtle sort of 
ways that they ignore her or they sort of slight her, you know, the fact that they don't call her by name necessarily. They very clearly don't know what her name is, but they'll refer to her address because like, you know, Melanie said, they all see, have seen the palatial mansion that's going up on the corner. Um, and I think she does pick up on that, but she has this sort of naive belief that she's going to be able to get past that easily like she I think she underestimates how deeply entrenched these people's sort of snobbiness actually is because she thinks that it's enough to just open the house up and people will show up if nothing else because they're curious about what the inside looks like and so she I think is shocked and then that shock sort of immediately turns to like vitriol (laughs) like and wanting to get her revenge for it very quickly she goes from sort of being hurt and and shocked and surprised to just like 180 degrees the other way like I'm gonna I'm gonna show them like very quickly and I think we're gonna see how that plays out obviously over the next nine episodes I don't think she's in for an easy easy time (laughs) I think she feels it I don't I don't know how you could not feel that shade but I think she just sort of plows through and I think she thinks that the money is going to be enough and I think that yeah she's for sure underestimating how much old New York is going to resist yeah because it's a power struggle I mean it's that's really what it comes down to is the asters and the old money are seeing these new people come in who have more wealth than they've ever had I mean that's really what it comes down to is that this new money they're not just new people that the old people don't know they are also redefining what it means to be wealthy in New York City. I mean, like the wealth that the old money have, like they're wealthy, but they're not, they're not industrialist money wealthy. And so I think that's part of the, the tension is the old money kind of seeing their status slip away because of the degree of wealth that like they can't even compete with realistically um, when you kind of, when push comes to shove. And success business, like, oh, sorry, Melly, just success, like new people coming in and having great success in the railroads, in industry, in, you know, whatever it is, like, that's something to be intimidated by. They weren't going to show that, but, but it is like new people are taking over the systems of, you know, the country. And that's, I'm sure was part of that. Like, well, we'll hang on to the social end. <laughs> you may right. be rich and you may be running the railroads, but we've got this, you know? Yeah. I think I was going to say so much of it seems obscene too, you know, like, mm-hmm building this giant mansion, um, kind of taking over the whole, the, they're essentially, they're going to turn over the whole block, you know, it, right. it, they're changing everything about the way that these people live. And I think that's why Agnes is holding so tight and, you know, thinking of the price that she paid to have the status that she did, as opposed to Bertha Russell coming in and just waltzing in on the scene. Like she is not, she's not going to have any of it because she paid that price and that price, you you know, can't be bought, I I think in a way. Yeah. I feel like the, the, to sum up sort of the feeling that the old money has about these new money people is like money doesn't buy you class, which, so it's, you know, to them, it's like, yeah, I don't care that you have more money than God and that you've made it in, you know, five years or two years or whatever. Um, that doesn't buy you the social standing and I'm the gatekeeper of the social standing. So I don't care how much money you have. You have to impress me. (laughs) And that's going to be harder than you think it is. Um, One of the things I loved is, so I'm watching this, I'm simultaneously watching and just like that. And so we're seeing in contrast with Cynthia Nixon. Nixon. (laughs) She's she's looming large in my life right now, but thinking back to, um, I think it's the first movie where Carrie kind of tosses her phone and she has to get a new phone number and it comes back and she's going to be like a three, four, seven. And she's like, no, no, I'm going to be, I'm a nine, one, seven girl. It's old New York. I'm yeah. not getting a new, like, that's still a thing. There are still lawsuits over who's going to get what area codes and what represents being old New York and new New York and who's taking over. And so that is something that we're still, still seeing today in, in different ways, but um, seeing what is the battle over what is New York and who gets to claim it. Yeah, for sure. And I think if for those of you, for anyone who's you know watching, who's really interested in sort of the minutia or the dynamics of the neighborhoods, you know, I would recommend there's podcasts out there that you can listen to, but the official Gilded Age podcast, which is attached to HBO, they have a really interesting discussion. They have a historian there who talk, who knows New York very well and talks about sort of 
what the significance of all of these different streets and neighborhoods are because they do they drop the name the names of the streets and the numbers of the streets a lot in the show and if you're not familiar with sort of the geography of Manhattan it doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense so they sort of break that down it was helpful for me to be like oh, okay I get now what they're talking about with like uptown downtown fifth yeah. avenue and like all of that stuff which we won't get into here <laughs> Is that line even the chef said 30th street is out of fashion like that's yes. where came from they're way down on 30th like that's just you know now they're on what right. 61st or something which the frick's home is 170th street so that helps me put it in perspective yeah. where the frick collection right. is you know we're creeping up creeping up fifth avenue toward uh toward central park and you know a breeze cool. side and to make another for connection, you know, they talk about the Russells, the fact that when they were on 30th Street, they were renting, you know, mm -hmm. and so that's the big jump that they're making that again, Bertha believes that now that they have a residence that is theirs that they own and that they built, that's going to be somehow that's going to be the key that sort of opens everything like she sort of almost believes like well, we were renting before like that was part of the problem. And then she finds that it wasn't, but the Fricks had a similar trajectory they rented at first when they moved to New York in 1905. And then build and sort of as they're building sort of what becomes the Frick collection. So again, it's another sort of interesting correlation between those two stories that I think was probably the case for a lot of people who were relocating to New York in this period, um, renting first and then sort of building. Um, so that was just sort of another interesting connection. Um, I want to talk about Peggy, though, because we are starting to run out of time and we wanted to talk about Peggy. She's sort of that other piece of this Victorian womanhood or this Gilded Age womanhood that we wanted to talk about. Um, she sort of represents that idea of the new woman. You have the true woman and the new woman in the Gilded Age, and she sort of represents that in some ways. She wants to be a career woman. She wants to be a writer and an author, but she has the additional struggles and the additional challenges not just of her gender but also of her race and so we see that play out in a lot of different ways in the episode and we feel like we're glad she's there she's such an important part of the story in terms of representing sort of the different aspects of lived experience in the gilded age but melanie i thought you had some really interesting idea you know thoughts about the fact that she's sort of set up like she has to represent the experiences of all Black Americans and the Gilded Age, yeah. which feels like too much pressure for one character. <laughs> She's doing a big job there. And I think it made me kind of wonder just watching like what is realistic. I'm sure they're tapping into different things, but for, you know, how is she inserted into the scene? I think right now the show is using her to um, point out the stark contrast between the Black experience in Gilded Age America and what we have been told and what we have seen on film before. Um, what I am hopeful for is that we get a really robust multi-dimensional picture of Peggy as things go on. So far in this episode, she's carried a very heavy load of showing us segregation, a segregated train car, a segregated dining room. She's seated with the servants. She's staying with the servants. She's joining the household staff um, at an elevated status as a secretary for um, Agnes, but still she, she's at a different level than Marion, but I really want to see how her career plays out. I want to see how her friendship with Marion plays out, and I think that she feels a little surprising in this show because we're not used to seeing middle-class Black women uh, depict, depicted in historical dramas or specifically of this period very often. Um, and that really made us think about this photograph that we're showing of four African-American women um, seated on the front steps of the university. This photograph was a part of a collection that was compiled by W.E.B. Du Bois for the Paris Exposition in 1900, and specifically a group of over 300 photographs that were pulled together and put on display to show the experience of affluent middle-class African-Americans in the South um, as a way of dispelling the stereotypes that were being put out to sort of promote racism and, and to show real almost joy, real um, full life that was, that was real. And I want that for Peggy. So I hope that we get to see Peggy um, to see her full life and and to meet some more of her friends and to see how um how the show connects her 
with her world and what they show us about Peggy's world. Well put. <laughs> well, and yeah. she, I think, like, yeah, I, I agree. She, it, I'm so glad she's there because I, the one thing that, you know, I, I think is important and I'm glad they did include it is this conversation right up front about segregation because there is maybe sometimes a, a miss. Um, um, you know, a misconception that segregation was exclusively a Southern thing. Um, you know, 1882, we're sort of um, five years-ish out from the end of Reconstruction. We're in that still post-Civil War period, but we're set in a Northern city. Um, and, you know, even though Jim Crow is is certainly something that's being enacted in this period, specifically in the South, it doesn't mean that those systems of prejudice are not also being practiced in Northern cities. So in that way, I, you know, it's good, I think that it was included just as if nothing else, just to kind of like hit us over the head and remind us like, hey, <laughs> like it, it's happening everywhere in the United States at this period. And it's certainly something that Black Americans were having to deal with regardless of where they lived, even in a big city like New York. Um, and yeah, like you said, there's just, there's lots of like little subtle mentions to just the prejudice that she comes up across just in her daily life. And I'm sure that will be unpacked more, um, you know, even in just the way that the white servants in the Van Ryan house sort of react to her. Some of them are okay with her being there. Some of them are clearly not okay with her being there. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's gonna be interesting to sort of see that play out for Peggy, for sure. And she wants to be a working woman on top of it, which is also sort of something that's maybe not as accepted at that period quite yet, so. Well, and that's a thread that I, I like between her and Marion. You know, Marion wants to be useful. She wants something to do. She doesn't want to do nothing. I think the line that I love, she said, I wanna be busy. I, wa I want to be in a hurry, which I really liked. I thought that was like such a, meaningful way to say like she wants something to do not just sitting in this room with my aunts like did she those two want different things than the other women and I like that about them and they're they're both facing barriers you know in all places to to their desire to be useful and so it'll be interesting to see where they where they take that and where they have success and where they're blocked you know by the people mm -hmm. around them society aunts you know, mothers, fathers, whatever that is. Um, but they both have that desire to, to work, which was not easy for, you know, women in the Gilded Age, unless you were one of the servants, which is again, a whole other episode, the domestic staff. Um, we were talking about comparisons with Downton Abbey and how in Downton Abbey, there was that very core domestic staff that you sort of fell in love with easily. Here we have multiple households, multiple servants to get to know. And so that's a, a whole other, you know, thing that we'll have to see how that, how that plays out um, with those two households and their parallel servants but competing perspectives <laughs> on old money new money yes which is players. which is a fantastic segue sort of to where we'll wrap up for today mm -hmm. obviously we were talking about this when we sort of were prepping for this first episode there's a million things that we could have talked about in this first episode can't get to it all sort of on one episode but we also realize that a lot of these things will carry on for sure through the rest of the show so if you were disappointed we had one follower uh question uh kim g412 was saying tell us more about mrs russell's dresses versus the old money women's dresses we will i will say stay tuned to that question because like melanie said we're probably going to end up devoting an entire episode of this after show just to fashion and kind of unpacking all of that because there's a lot to talk about um, the domestic staff is certainly another huge part of this story that we do want to talk about. It's a lot to unpack in terms of the reality of both of those households that's being represented here that we definitely, you know, want to talk about. And, um, you know, we'll talk about the Russells more and, and all of this stuff as we sort of see the show um, unfold. Um, of course, uh, we hope that you'll be back with us next week. Uh, we're going to keep watching uh, the Gilded Age uh, as it comes out, and we'll be re keep releasing our after show episodes every Friday after the new episodes come out. So we hope you'll join us back here um, to, to talk about episode two and beyond. Um, if you have questions about the Gilded Age that you want us to answer, um, the best way to get in touch with us is on our Instagram. Um, so if you don't already follow the Frick on Instagram, you can find us at FrickPGH. Um, and we'll be soliciting uh, follower questions as we go along. So if there's a burning question that you really want us to answer, um, that's a great way to get it in front of us. Um, but I want to thank Amanda and Melanie for taking time out of the day to chat with me and to chat about all the juicy details. Um, and we will be back next week with more of the unofficial Gilded Age After Show. Thank you, everyone. 
Yeah. I've got one final word. Oh, yes. You it. do have one final word. I almost do cut not, you off. Do not carry your painting like this. I this guess. Is not how carry a painting down the stairs. Maybe it's how they did it in the Russell household. But in that case, you know, it's amazing that anything has survived. Don't do it like this. We will throw in our art handling criticisms as we see them. That is a PSA from a curatorial professional, <laughs> museum professional, saying he do not carry your artwork. He's got gloves on, so you know. <laughs> he does have gloves on. I yeah, I don't know that they're like archival gloves. They're like work <laughs> gloves, but that's something. Um it's a yes, point that's person. another that's another good point. We will definitely talk interiors, we will talk art, we will talk all of those things because that is something we couldn't even get to today that is definitely going to be worth worth talking about. Um so thank you, Melanie, for that PSA <laughs> on art handling. <laughs> so like I said, we'll be back next week with a whole new episode. Um and we'll see you then. Thank you. Send us your questions. Yeah, send us your questions.